So uh, in this video, we're going to take a quick look at the historical cultural context uh, when you are uh, exegeting a passage of scripture. And so here, I just want to point out a few things uh, when engaging in the kind of the cultural context of a passage, uh, why it needs to be done, and then what kind of questions you need to be thinking about as you're uh, going through this process. So uh, we'll begin here, first of all, by just noting that why it is important to keep the historical context in mind when exegeting a passage of scripture. So what we're trying to do here is to gain the perspective or the values that's shared by the author and his audience. And these are often not made explicit in the text because the author assumes that his audience knows their, you know, that knows their time, knows their, their backgrounds, knows lots of the vocabularies and the ideas. That are already present, uh, and so he doesn't uh, have to be particularly explicit uh, or in go into detail when making references about uh, what people ought to do or about ideas. Uh, and so, but because our world uh, is so different than the world of the first century authors of the New Testament, work needs to be done in order to try and better appreciate what's going on at the time and place where these uh, authors are writing uh, and where their audiences live. So what we're doing is we're uh, ascertaining how the revelation of God's will was originally contextualized. And by doing this, we we're hoping then that it can help point us uh, in a clear direction in how to contextualize uh, this revelation of God's will uh, in today's context, since our world is not like the world in the first century in terms of the kinds of values and ideas and practices that are going on today, many of which were not existent in the first century. Uh, and so in order to make application of the eternal principle that can be found uh, behind the text, in other words, what is being presupposed by the author as they write to their audience, it's important to, first of all, ascertain or identify what's going on and why certain things are being um, advocated or expressed and what kind of things are being assumed about the world in which people are living in. So uh, we've got to keep that in mind. So there are, of course, several problems that anyone who wants to investigate the historical cultural context of a passage of Scripture are going to have to face. So first of all, we have our own set of historical, social, cultural assumptions. So there are things that we just think because of the world in which we live in that this uh, truth or this reality is real for everybody else. Um, and very oftentimes, these are read back into the biblical text. In other words, we think that what it is we uh, assume about, say, men and women, or about uh, people, or about a group of people, say, for instance, the Jews, we might think that these assumptions were already in existence at the time that these books were written, and very oftentimes they, they are not. And so we have to be able to get comfortable in terms of distancing the assumptions we have with what the evidence is of what existed in the first century. Uh, certainly there is more historical, social, cultural information that exists than any one person could master. So we all have to depend on others. It, you know, there are many, many scholars working on many different aspects of the Greco-Roman world uh, in which uh, these authors lived. And uh, there's constantly new discoveries or new insights, new approaches, new questions. Um, and nobody is able to have a mastery of all of them. And so uh, you know, within scholarship, we're learning from each other. We're listening to, to each other. And um, so you've got to be able to um, read widely in order to gain the, some of the information that might be most relevant to interpreting your particular passage. Also, there's not enough um, uh, historical, social, cultural information 
to answer sufficiently all of our questions. So the evidence that we have to reconstruct the past is always quite selective. It is limited. Um, you know, we only can dig up so much of the uh, ancient world, and we only have the literature of a certain amount of people uh, who describe the world uh, at this time. So we have limited um, you know, literature, we have limited archaeological discoveries. So, you know, we some, oftentimes would like to know more about the, the world of the first century, but it simply is not present for us. So what we're trying to do oftentimes is extract out of limited information some general ideas about what we think that world must have been like. And also, how do we go about investigating all the evidence? Uh, because there, what evidence there is, there's quite a, a lot of it. Um, and just what do you give priority to? What do you place as the most significant evidence in order to um, interpret a particular passage? So you have to make choices. Um, so you look at your passage and uh, that you'll be working on. And so there will be certain things inside that passage that you think, okay, I'm going to dig in to the evidence for this particular idea. It's maybe the idea of spiritual beings that, that existed. What did you know, Greeks think about these uh, variety of spiritual beings? What did Jews think about it? What, I mean, certain Jews believed about it, certain Greeks or certain Romans. Um, and, you know, which information do you give more weight to in order to apply it to your text to, to make sense of it? Uh, so this is that question, how do we determine which evidence is most significant since it all looks very interesting, but how do we go about placing a, a sense of priority? We're going to be kind of led, as it were, by the demands of our text. So uh, just uh, some principles here about going through this process. Um, so first of all, try to identify the, the author. Can you say who the author is? Now, for uh, you know several letters that are ascribed to Paul, there's a lot of scholarly consensus that this person named Paul actually did write these letters. So for instance, Romans, uh, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, um, many of these are assumed to be written by Paul, also Philippians. Um, but some letters are attributed to, to Paul, and there are questions about whether or not the apostle actually wrote those. So we have the pastoral epistles, we have which is 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. We have Ephesians and Colossians. So, you know, questions, right? How do you know uh, what's going to be the um, uh, evidence that something that is ascribed to Paul actually was written to him, you know, besides just making the claim that, well, because it's there, it must be true, because I believe that, I believe it's the Bible, and because it's the Bible, it's true. That's kind of a circular type of, uh, of reasoning. Um, but, you know, that may be, you know, your position, but in order to, to engage in kind of a critical scholarly discussion, you're going to have to have some kind of arguments in terms of uh, why it makes sense that this actually does uh, come from Paul, since we do know that pseudepigraphy, you know, ascribing to somebody else authorship of a certain document was a, a common thing. So uh, why do we think certain letters ascribed to Paul are likely to be from him? Uh, the same thing is, you know, who do you think might have written 1st, 2nd, 3rd John? There's, of course, church traditions. You just accept church tradition at face value, or may there have been other reasons why the church um, uh, attached a certain author, usually an apostle, to it. This becomes kind of difficult for some because we might just not be able to know. For instance, the book of Hebrews, you don't know who the uh, author is, although there was one tradition that it was Paul that became quite popular, but we don't know this for certain, and even in earlier, very early stages, we uh, the question of authorship of Hebrews was uh, was up in the air. Uh, same thing is with with the Gospels. There are traditional 
um, uh, attributions of who the authors were, but how do we know? Um, what's, what, what would be the arguments that would be used to, to defend a particular person having written that gospel? And so sometimes it may be you don't, we don't know who the author is. Uh, and uh, we might be able to say something about who the audience were, uh, where they might have been located, maybe because of how the, the document or how this book of the Bible first appears, who seemed to be first using it in the early church, um, what might be assumed uh, within the letter or the gospel um, that gives a hint as to who the audience might be, and the occasion. In other words, what's going on? What, what's happened in the life of the audience or the life of the, of the author that gave rise for the need for this particular book? So that's going to be one of the first things you, you have to do. Uh, other things you're going to have to do is you're going to have to identify any items that need to be explored for the historical cultural background. So are different rulers uh, mentioned? Are there different groups, Pharisees, Sadducees? Um, are there um, you know, different practices that are going on? The wearing of veils, prayer, uh, singing, singing hymns, uh, washing hands. So well, what are these things that are going on uh, that we might need to explore to get a better feel? We also want to ensure that the background evidence comes from the same period. So if, if you're wanting to describe that something existed in the first century as background information for a book, you got to make sure that the, the historical evidence you use to make that claim actually comes in the first century or before it. So using something as evidence that comes at a much later period, say, the second century, third century, fourth century, that is not as secure, that is not as definitive because things change. And just because something may have been a practice or an idea may have existed or groups had existed, you know, 40, 50, 60, 100, 200 years later, doesn't mean it was true in the first century. So does the evidence, the background information that you have whether from literature, from archaeology, does it uh, you know, predate the writing of the book that you are uh, investigating, that you're seeking to exegete? Um, so, but, but we also don't want to ignore that there is a historical development. In other words, okay, I can't claim for certain that's, that a certain idea that occurs in a book that's later, in the first century, um, existed at the time when this author wrote, but I also might want to consider the possibilities of these ideas and how they have impacted uh, ideas that develop later. Also, uh, don't be too narrowly selective in gathering evidence uh, or dismiss the Bible itself as evidence because, you know, we have uh, background information about ideas and places in the Bible itself. And so the Bible can be a primary source. Earlier books that were written before um, a particular author wrote can be used as evidence of ideas that would have e existed. Uh, and so we want to try and, and gather widely um, the evidence that is there and then begin to sift, as it were, what we think is most relevant, most significant, most helpful in explaining uh, these elements within the text. But always remember to keep the text's main point in focus. So this can be a real trick here because sometimes you'll find a detail, a background, and it becomes so fascinating to you and you get some really interesting insights, historical background information for it, um, and then want to somehow or another make the passage more about that detail than what the author is really making the main focus. 
So while we have to do the historical background and gather things to help us understand the text, we have to be careful not allowing that information to override what the main point uh, is. So questions to be asking, just kind of keep these questions in the forefront when you're going through this, is what are the general characteristics of the culture this book was written from and was written to? So the New Testament is primarily uh, uh, Greco-Roman background. If you're doing something from the Old Testament in your exegesis, then you have kind of uh, maybe Israelite, or you might have a Babylonian, or you might have a Persian uh, context. So you've got to kind of know when things were, were written as best as you can, especially again with Old Testament texts, it becomes very difficult to identify authors. Uh, it becomes very difficult to identify the exact dates. Uh, usually with Old Testament texts, you're, you're going to be dealing with hundreds of years of possibility of when a text may have been written. Um, you know, I think maybe only the book of Daniel, as far as I know, might be able to be dated within a very limited time, like what we do with New Testament texts. But you want to just try and get general ideas. And so uh, this is where you know, good Bible dictionaries and Bible encyclopedias can be very helpful in describing generally time periods and uh, who is ruling and what are some of the major problems and major events that, that take place during that time. So you look for people, places, events, you look for institutions, you're looking for concepts, you're looking for customs, uh, what, what's mentioned. And you're also looking at what primary sources are likely to provide information on any of these. So primary sources, again, are those sources that would be written in the ancient periods, primarily. Um, uh, secondary sources are, you know, like your encyclopedias and your dictionaries and your commentaries, because all those authors are utilizing these primary sources to help describe or explain. So really good exegesis is done when uh, someone is engaged with the primary sources, uh, these ancient sources written at the time or predating the time uh, of the particular biblical book. Um, and um, instead of just relying upon what a more modern or contemporary author might claim is in those primary sources because what people claim are is in the primary sources again the are oftentimes nuancing those ideas and so what someone might have claimed say in the 1960s about people places events and institutions well a lot more research has been taking place since the 1960s and so we have new insights new ways of thinking about uh, these things so you want to make sure that if you're using these secondary sources um, that you are using things that are quite current with the new information. So know the major Jewish primary sources. You know, looks like Josephus, looks like uh, Philo, you know, Pseudepigrapha, Apocrypha, um, as well, of course, even in the biblical uh, books. So you want to know what some of those are, maybe even rabbinic literature like um, Mishnah, the dates after the time of the first century, they can be helpful because there may be traditions within them that predate uh, the New Testament. But you want to be familiar with the major Jewish primary sources, and you want to be included in with what the major Greco-Roman primary sources are as well. Of course, you know, the classics of Homer and Iliad, but as well, you want to be aware of uh, great authors like you know Plato and, and Aristotle. I mean, there's lots of things that are written uh, by you know, Greeks and Romans um, before the time that the New Testament was written, during the same time the New Testament was written. Uh, that gives us insight into the things that are going on in that world. So. Being familiar with what those major sources are and utilizing those sources can greatly add or benefit towards your exegesis. All right, I think we'll go ahead and just stop it there with uh, this kind of 
uh, introduction to historical cultural context. And I know that uh, with the textbook that you're reading out of Gorman, you'll be able to get uh, some additional information about how to go about doing this for your exegesis.